Aló. Señores, por favor, tomemos asiento para continuar con el programa. A continuación, vamos Please a take your seats. We will now begin the panel of ministers of the Consortium, Agriculture Consortium of the South. Please take your seats. And we request the ministers to please come to the rostrum. We're waiting for the Uruguayan minister in order to start our panel discussion. Gentlemen, we'll be starting our panel discussion of ministers of the Southern Consortium. The minister of Uruguay is in a press conference with the President of the Republic, and he will join us soon as vice chair of the Global AR 4D. I uh, have the privilege of the presence and participation of representatives of the governments of Brazil, Argentina, Chile, Uruguay, who will be presently with us, and Bolivia. We'll be exchanging some ideas on the major policies and concerns that we face in agricultural development in order to eliminate poverty, improve food security, and take advantage of natural, natural resources. And as the president of Uruguay just said, they represent the last corner of the agricultural uh, development. With this, I'll start 
our meeting, the procedure will be as follows. I will be reading some questions, and I will ask each one of the ministers, one answers, then the next, and then after their answers have been heard, we'll go on to the second question, and we'll, ha we'll open the floor for any uh, questions from the audience for the ministers. That will be our procedure. I will start now. The first question addressed to the Minister of Agriculture of Argentina, considering the importance of increasing food production in the region, highlighted by many because it represents a food reserve for the world to supply for growing global demand, which mechanisms should be promoted to uh, drive research and development in the CAS countries and which are the major constraints to achievement of that potential? The minister has the floor. Good afternoon, all. Thank you for this invitation to participate in this very important event. I think that for the world and for those of us who have some responsibility at the time when policy decision making decisions are taken, a few minutes ago this was highlighted by President Mujica. All of our ideas in science and technology will be useless unless we have a response from the state and from the political level through public policy for development and the upstarting of all of that research. I think basically, and it's our view from Argentina, we have set up a scheme subdivided into two important parts. The first one is a program which is the 2020 Argentine plan that cost time to prepare. We had the participation of all Argentine universities, colleges, uh, scientific and technical institutions having to do with livestock and agricultural development in Argentina, the provincial level, the state levels. And this set up certain goals that the government and municipalities would address for agricultural development in Argentina vis-a-vis -vis 2020, particularly because in the next 30 or 40 years, a complex world will need food for more than 1 billion inhabitants or 9 billion inhabitants. Argentina produces food for 400 million and it has 52 million inhabitants. So what we seek because of a principle of fairness and equity is not only vis-a-vis -vis Latin America but the whole world rather because we all live in this world and foreseeing the needs of the new millions of inhabitants, how do we uh, build the tools from the government to ensure that we have the necessary supply so that no country in the world may face hunger, so that no one will die of hunger in the world, and that's our vocation. Then we can discuss prices, commodities, the market, etc. But the first thing we must have in mind is combating hunger. And we have very clear goals, the large-scale production increases where we have tonnage of production of grains. Uh, we've had some increases in the past few years. The year before last, it had three 103 million tons. And before that, it was 92 million tons. And this has been a very good year. So we're expecting 110 or 115 million tons of production. So there is strong momentum, particularly because of the synergy 
in the government's position, a posture, but also the promotion and driving of production in Argentina. The second stage to analyze that viewpoint of Argentina uh, has to do with family farming. There we have the second broad axis we must tackle. And President Mujica was referring to how can we find the small producers, the farmers that may have five cows, 20 hens, how do we identify them and find their an identity for them and have them work together with the state and the community for their incorporation to the food production chain to enhance the value of what they produce and the sustainability of it too as well. Because sometimes the, their work is not sustainable and if extra work is required from the state in terms of microcredits, the incentives having to do with fertilizers and fungicides in improving land tenure that is one of the broadest problems that Latin, the South American countries face. Land tenure, when it's not identified, when the owner is not identified, it's a problem that's been with us for hundreds of years since South America is South America and since our countries obtained their independence. And it's something that's being discussed in many countries at present. The uh, laws having to do with fo foreign ownership of land and land tenure for small plots so that our small producers and campesinos may have a possibility to do what they know how to do, which is to produce. And the leverage be leveraging behind this by the state, providing knowledge and infrastructure, the possibilities for the small producers to develop, for the farmers, the small farmers to be able to produce. Large producers usually are corporations, they have banking lines of credit, they can sell their products abroad, but there is a very important range in South America, which is more than 70% of Latin American production that is based on family farming. And the 2020 uh, Food and Agriculture Program of Argentina has focused on the development of these small producers so that the both the big farmer and the small farmers may have the same tools and reach the development that Argentina has as a goal for 2020. Mr. Minister, thank you. We'll ask the Minister of Brazil. Which he what he considers to be the pathway to increase food production, considering the reserves in the world and Latin America as a reserve of the world to provide for a global demand, which should be the mechanisms to promote investigation or research uh, at all levels. We must acknowledge that Brazil has uh, an agricultural research, research policy that's been very successful and has grown in what has to do with agro-business throughout the Americas, and particularly it has become a very relevant component of the Brazilian agricultural kit. So, Mr. Minister, which are the constraints and how do we address uh, agricultural research to promote the development of our countries. Thank you. First of all, I must clarify that our minister is not present due to a previous commitment. He has a commitment tomorrow precisely on the issue of land ownership by foreigners. Secondly, I come from a country where we do not speak Spanish. So I ask uh, all of you patience and understanding vis-a-vis -vis my portuñol. 
as the minister has indicated, the world is in a process of growth of the population, the world population. Today, we are 7 billion people, but by 2050, we shall be 9 billion people on Earth. So, we need to increase production in order to provide for production uh, consumption by an extra 2 billion people. We also face the phenomenon of growth of income in the world, particularly in Asia and the Middle East, and also in the case of China, we have large migrations from the rural areas to the cities, to the urban areas. So we will have more people living in cities and less people, less producers in the countryside. Likewise, there is a growing demand for biofuel production throughout the world. And finally, we face the challenge of global climate change. So we face challenges on the one hand, on the side of demand, and we have challenges on the side of supply of agricultural products. Since 2008, prices have seen an upsurge, an enormous upsurge throughout the world. And this year, we have seen a great loss of maize in the United States, which affected the prices of agricultural commodities. The Cast region, the southern cone of South America, is a region which is considered capable of providing for the growing demand for agricultural products and food by the world. In fact, today, Brazil and Argentina are the two countries having the greatest agricultural surplus in exports. No other country in the world, e not even the United States or the European Union, have a trade surplus in agriculture as large as that of Brazil and Argentina. This is a good way of measuring the capabilities of the region, including Uruguay, Paraguay, Bolivia, Chile, to provide for the growing demand existing in the world. But we need new technologies, and we need to promote, to drive development in other regions. In the case of Brazil, through Embrapa, which is the main enterprise or institution for research in agriculture in Brazil, we have a growing process it's engaged in a growing process of cooperation with other countries. Here we have with us the director of Embrapa with us. Embrapa is promoting international cooperation, principally with Africa. We consider that we have a large debt towards Africa. We are 
striving to give priority to cooperation with African countries and also with countries in Latin America and the Caribbean. So we understand that this cooperation will provide for transfer of knowledge in tropical agriculture to countries that need to improve their conditions of production in tropical climates. But Embrapa also engages in cooperation with developed countries in the manner of developing virtual laboratories with the United States, with France, England, China, South Korea. So we have these experiences in uh, being together and in approaching the frontiers of knowledge. All of this to promote no, and not only for Brazilian producers, but also through international production to uh, provide conditions for improved development for other farmers throughout the world and enhance productivity in order to produce more in lesser space. We have growing constraints that we face in increased areas for production, uh, sown and or planted, and also constraints due to availability of water. Thank you. Thank you. The representative of Bolivia wishes to ask you to what extent your country is taking initiatives to strengthen research and improve the levels of production and productivity, and what constraints you estimate uh, your country faces at present. Thank you very much. I'd like to greet the ministers of Uruguay, Paraguay, and Argentina, Brazil, representatives of the ministries and all of you brothers and sisters who form part of CAS. And I'd like to likewise bring the greeting of our Minister for Rural Development and Land, Minister Coyo, who would have been present here, but she is now in the United States to make a presentation on the International Year of Quinoa. We are here representing her to exchange criteria and knowledge being implemented by each CAS member country, and definitely Bolivia is a country that is changing policy, not just in the social area, but basically in the ag agrarian area since President Evo Morales has uh, become president. We have made important progress and we'd like to approach food security within the country from, the stand from an integrated standpoint. In other words, that we go through legal security in terms of ownership of land. Bolivia has faced very traumatic instances of land ownership problems. We have an agrarian reform of 1953 and a large number of uncertainty that in 1992 ended with an intervention by the Council for Agrarian Reform due to corruption, problems of corruption, and since then there have been a series of consensus through uh, social organizations in Bolivia to give continuity to the work, but within a legal framework. So Bolivia started to walk along a new pathway 
and we should confront the situation from an integrated point of view and that structure of land tenure in Bolivia that had been ex equitable in the past, approximately 40 million hectares were in the hands of middle-sized uh, uh, entrepreneurs and were not used for the purpose that they should be used for, but rather for fattening of cal a cattle without giving the adequate use the land should have. And about 17 million hectares were distributed into the property of campesinos and small farmers, people who lived from the land. Through this process of agrarian reform, undertaken by our president, we have a more equitable distribution of land. We've identified 23.3 million hectares of fiscal land in Bolivia, not all of it available, but from the 40 million hectares of land that were in the hands of middle-sized entrepreneurs and were not productive, 4 million have been identified, the rest is distributed among the communities, the native communities in the hands of social campesino organizations and farmers who through the community associations are promoting a process of food production but recovering the ancestral uh, uh, assets. We are recovering those assets to incorporate them to our daily life. So that example of land te tenure that starts on the basis of legal security, we'd like to link it to uh, production development programs that will be in support of production development and true rural development in Bolivia. So that is what we're implementing now and we must create the conditions, the necessary conditions to be able to increase agricultural and livestock production in the country to guarantee production of food, first of all, for Bolivia and then for export. Important estimates have been made, for example, consumption has been studied of the major staples produced by Bolivia in kilos. The most consumed product is potato. We have 92 kilos per person uh, per year. That's an average we've obtained. And in terms of flour, sure, sugar, chicken meat, uh, the pork meat, the tomatoes, uh, carrots, and quinoa, then we have a standardized production, a stable production, and we've We've conducted this study to guarantee domestically and afterwards export these staples. So we believe that policies must be confronted in an integrated fashion. We're still in the process of guaranteeing legal ownership of the land. We've had 32 million that will be uh, identified by 2013, and it will be the beginning of productive development. And then we'll implement the plans and programs that we'll be commenting on later. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Barriga, for this uh, task, for this meeting, for your friends. Thank you for inviting us.
En materia de investigación, policy in terms of research and development tries to promote adding value to products. As Dr. Barriga said, Chile doesn't export commodities, uh, but rather uh, products with uh, a little bit more of added value in the, um, in the counter season with the Northern Hemisphere. Another important issue in our research policy in Chile is that apart from having a good basis of public organizations, there is a lot of activity with private uh, companies, and it is important to highlight some agencies working with the private um, sector. We've got an organization uh, uh, and uh, co-payment of uh, uh, research projects with private with the private sector that become uh, productive tools interesting for farmers our INEA our Chilean research institute in agriculture has a long record a quite powerful one doing uh, research scientific and applied research quite applied and it is quite in touch with farmers. We are also doing applied research at an institute called INVAT, focused on small uh, livelihood. Uh, this represents 94.4% uh, uh, in the number of farmers, and therefore there are many farmers uh, requiring development and transfer of knowledge so that they can, um, they can uh, place their productions. We have developed uh, public policy programs, starting alliances between uh, farmers and the state for uh, technological transfers, for to improve genetics and uh, adequate funding so that agriculture can do its best. There is also another challenge to articulate the supply and the demand, which is another weak point that we may have in agriculture. We also need a lot of information. Our Office of uh, Agrarian Studies uh, generates uh, knowledge and transfers it to farmers in order to uh, increase interest in uh, research that can be transformed into applied knowledge. I would also like to mention an institute that is under the Ministry of the Economy. It, that institute has 53 programs of activities together with the private sector. There are associations, there are um, alliances between the public and partnerships between the private and the public sector. There is a contest that was uh, highlighted by The Economist. It's called Startup Chile, where monies are uh, given, a significant amount of money is uh, given to entrepreneurs, to young people who would like to develop new projects can do so. And thus, uh, the young population can remain in the rural areas because many of them tend to emigrate. We also have uh, seed capital projects, technological packages, risk capital uh, programs for technological determination, and many other programs that uh, involve technology transfers from the public to the private sectors. One of the most important uh, issues so that uh, development is successful is technology transfer. There's no doubt about that. 
in all our countries, in CAS, we can see that there are very significant figures about this. For instance, uh, wheat yields from 12 to 15 tons per hectare, maize 25 to 30 uh, tons per hectare. These are averages that we can get in very small surfaces. We've got the technology. The challenge is how we can transfer that technology so that small farmers can take it up and improve every year. Our weakness is our heterogeneity. How can we have small farmers improve their productivity and reach reasonable and attractive levels? That's a large challenge. Among the challenges is the lack of resources, and that challenge uh, requires a lot of attention to put in more money. Uh, public research will always be insufficient. Private research will also be insufficient because of the characteristics of our agriculture. It's always insufficient. Of course, the way to get to small agriculture through transfers is another challenge that allows us to be uh, very open to public policy that can allow us to make the best uh, technology transfer. We are working at uh, several fronts at the same time. This is true to our Chilean agriculture. We have problems of uh, irrigation and water. We are looking for efficiency. There are public calls uh, for projects, and this is one big issue. Of course, uh, climate adaptation is another big issue. Better land management is another challenge as well. We've got public policies for different calls. Uh, so that uh, farmers can improve the use of the soil because it's uh, scant and uh, expensive. There are some projects of uh, genetic improvement where in the excels there are challenges for a small agriculture, how we can technify it, how we can mechanize it, and how we can have an agriculture engineer of the best level. We are also aware in our government that uh, we have to process food much more. We have to limit exports of commodities, and we have to try and process food much more to add value. That's another enormous challenge. We have also a question of safety and food safety. That's uh, another very important issue. Lots of uh, research is being done, and uh, um, we hope that this can uh, uh, result in safer food for the world. This is our approach to the subject, Dr. Barriga. Thank you, Gustavo. And next, uh, we would like to ask Enzo Bennett, on behalf of the Ministry of Agriculture, and Livestock, and Fisheries of Uruguay, to give us his uh, outlook as to how you are developing research and innovation and how uh, you can see the growth of agricultural production to uh, reach uh, the Millennium Development Goals and be able to feed the world more and increase food safety. And so please, good afternoon. Welcome. Welcome, um, colleagues, ministers. I'm sorry I was late. I was I was uh, accompanying uh, the minister in a parallel activity, uh, the, the president in a parallel activity. So I would like to welcome you. It's a pleasure to have you here, and let's hope that this meeting is useful. In Uruguay, the issue of uh, agricultural research and innovation uh, has, is is very rich in terms of institutions, and uh, there is a good supply of resources. We've got a condition, as you all know, we are a small country. So we measure resources according to our population and the GDP, and if we do so, we're not that bad. I would say we're quite well. Quite. We measure it in absolute values. We're far away from any big country. Of course, that uh, is a strong condition for our research and innovation processes, and therefore we have to define very clearly what our priorities are. Here we have an innovation council at the highest level, at minister, ministry, ministerial level. We've got an innovation agency articulating research and innovation processes through the academia. 
There are several other institutions. Some of them depend on the Ministry of, Agri of Education and Culture, such, such as the Clemente Stable Institute. There is also the Pasteur Institute. Uh, we've got INEA, which is our flagship for agricultural research. We are strongly trying to make, and we've got the University of the Republic of Uruguay. That's a very strong institution here from our government. We are trying to, ha to do an inst institutional work, to work in a network to see our capacities and to use resources efficiently. Obviously, that's a permanent challenge, but we are fully persuaded that that's the only way in which we can use resources well. At the Innovation Council, where we are acting directly, and uh, we have recently tabled some criteria from the standpoint of research, but mainly uh, from the standpoint of agricultural innovation, we have tabled the main um, foresight where we should uh, uh, put our efforts to work. And uh, I am saying this because for us, it is absolutely of a paramount importance that uh, efforts are focused on innovation without ignoring basic research. Without basic research, we won't be able to have any innovation. However, because we are a small country and uh, because agriculture activities are, lie at the basis of our economic activities, at least 70% of all our exports are on agricultural goods. The innovation process is clear. And so uh, we would like to have most of the resources by our society end up in an innovative process, solving the problems that our agricultural production has, and that farmers become are empowered and can have their products. And that is a very strong political decision that we are constantly promoting all along our institutions. You were asking what our country was doing to respond to the growing need of food. I think that Uruguay has uh, very clear and specific examples about that. At present, uh, we've been having uh, sustained growth in our production uh, activities uh, for 10 years. And our, um, we've got something like a million hectares of um, forest, a million hectares in uh, soybean, um, winter crops that are also important. But uh, let me give you some examples so that you can envision this. Uh, dairy production from 2004 to 2010, we improved, we increased our milk production uh, by 34 percent with a fewer, um, with a fewer uh, surface, with uh, something like 800 liters more uh, per cow, and with some hectares more. What does this mean? It means an increase in productivity. This is the response of our country to that, because the surface of our country is still the same, but we are exporting more milk. We are exporting the same meat at higher uh, prices because we are exporting to markets that pay more. We export wood and we export grains. Uruguay hasn't got a tradition of uh, being a grain exporter. We used to import grains. Now we are exporting grain. Last year, for instance, uh, soybean exceeded meat exports. Grain exceeded meat exports. And that's productivity. That's technology. And I would also like to take advantage of this occasion to explain that this must be strongly backed up on the sustainability of the product, uh, sy production system. We've got plans for land management so that the production activity, productive activity is in line with uh, the use of our land. As from 2013, those plans will become compulsory. Those plans are sent in to our ministry by the private companies. We don't tell them what they have to plant, but they say, give us a plan so that uh, the use of your soil is sustainable. 
And I think that that's a responsibility that our country has as a government. We have to look after natural resources because they are finite and uh, they will be depleted if we don't take care of them. And I'm referring to water and uh, soil. So the, the answer to a higher productivity is that I think we have technology. Mankind has uh, uh, given clear signs that uh, we can produce more but we shouldn't forget our natural resources, and that's uh, embedded in our research and innovation policies. Thank you. Thank you, Enzo. I would like to touch upon, uh, very briefly, uh, on the opinion of the uh, representatives from the ministers of agriculture, ministers and secretaries and directors about uh, a topic that is a matter of concern for many in the world, and that involves the climate change. We are experiencing, experiencing very significant climate changes. Several countries are facing droughts that uh, have never been seen before. There are others that uh, suffer floods. Argentina was having a, a very strong uh, storm, um, and its airport was closed in New York. They have a hurricane uh, that would go down south to uh, North Carolina, Miami. So climate change is one of the most important variables that uh, we must face if we want to pursue our efforts in, uh, to increase production, to increase productivity, uh, fight against poverty and food safety. Therefore, I'd like to give the, uh, the chance, give the chance to the various representatives to see how, to what extent this climate change is affecting their countries and how we are looking for mechanisms to solve this problem of climate change because that's a growing problem that we are seeing everywhere. Mr. Minister. Obviously, this is a complex issue in itself because it touches upon a number of variables and agriculture is a small part vis-a-vis what climate change causes. Decades and decades of consumption, massive consumption of fossil fuels, continuous damage to our soils as a result of uh, excessive use of fertilizers because until we became aware over time of how we had to make a reasonable use of fertilizers, adequate uh, methods of irrigation. We couldn't irrigate <coughs> anymore by flooding as we used to do decades ago, as we couldn't continue burning and uh, deforesting areas as a result of the expansion of agriculture because scrubland where we felt a whole forest sometimes to have more area either for uh, real estate projects because elimination of scrubland and the felling of trees often was due not only to have more arable land but also for uh, real estate development, often because the timber was used to generate energy. Other cases were hotel uh, projects. So. Worldwide, there was a generalized management of not paying sufficient attention to an important issue such as this, but from the viewpoint of agriculture. And the challenges we face with agriculture, producing food for the future and caring for our products, this is where we started taking care as a country. We've developed a program of intelligent agriculture, seeking not to damage the soil. That's why we use no-till equipment when we have uh, large, extensive arable lands. 
This is an extraordinary technology which was developed by our National Farming Technology Institute, INDA. From the part from the government, we changing the uh, axis of energy consumption in our country, from burning millions of liters, tons of fossil fuels, we now have preferred an alternative energy program, basically uh, wind energy. Fortunately, our country has great potential for developing wind power. We also photovoltaic energy is another source in the Cuso area where there the potential is very high. Same as our neighbors uh, in Chile that have great potential with photovoltaic energy. And we're developing a energy program using biomass with all the surplus we have from the harvest. After cleaning and filling the uh, scrubland, this also means that we'll have a generation of energy where we will no longer use that energy that generates carbon, which is what has massively caused the deterioration of climate. But to this, we add sustainable use of the land with controlled fertilizers, pesticides, uh, irrigation capacity. We don't have large areas of dikes where before we haven't conducted environmental impact studies because the world has also, to generate energy, has built dikes and dams where they shouldn't have been. And therefore, they take space from agriculture, and today we see the conference in our country. We have very large area. We had very good margins, which were used by agriculture, and now there's they're sorry because now there are dry areas and we need technology to have artificial irrigation where naturally the area had an irrigation that if it was controlled in a different manner, the outcome would have been much better. So I think that here also the political decision of governments is important because we, if there, we don't make a political decision, nothing is decided really, but the next day we're gone and nothing has been done to change. So we must be consistent. This should be discussed within our countries and then they should be put in on paper and implemented because it's not just a philosophic issue and the problem is never addressed. I think given the breadth of the subject, if we address them as we are doing alternative energy, avoiding uh, carbon emissions, forestation. We've got an aggressive uh, forestation policy in Argentina. We want to have many more hectares planted with forest. We want to recover forest, one that was lost for many years in the Andean area because there was no control, there was no thinning, and uh, things weren't done as they should have done. So all this has been changed with management policies through the provincial governments, the forest authorities, and the other day at the Buenos Aires Grains Exchange we were presenting the pro-biomass uh, energy production program. The Ministry of Agriculture, the Ministry of the Environment, the Secretariat of the Environment of Argentina, and the Ministry of Economy, and there is a study and this is to show the impact sometimes. If we take the average of forest fires of the last five years, the annual average was equivalent to a generation of 30% of the energy consumed by my country in one year. Per year, fires, that's what they represent, which means that if the government has an adequate policy to avoid those fires and uses the thinning and uh, cleaning of the scrubland, without causing any environmental damage, we can produce the same amount of energy that we produce because of lack of control by the government. And of course, a part is all the biomass produced in the area surrounding the fire and the danger to neighboring populations. So now I think that the world is becoming aware and the governments have the obligations to be proactive. In this regard, apart from debates that we have at conferences, we have to move forward with real programs to replace the generation of energy with clean 
uh, sources of energy, and we also have to see the issue of biofuels. Why, in some cases, do we consume elements to produce uh, biofuels? This uh, discussion of Argentina being one of the leading biofuels of soy-based biofuels because we have a chain that allows us to use all the waste for fattening animals. So we use part of that for energy production and that we didn't export because we needed, and I go back to what our friend from Chile said today, the financial aspect, how we generate sufficient revenues for our countries to have the financial tool which allows our institutes to continue developing technology and farmers also have a sustainable way with short, with low interest loans to adopt tools that do not harm the soil, to have tools to have controlled irrigation, modern tools not to abuse the, the use of pesticides and fungicides. I think it's all about the struggle where the government must focus on that. That's what my country has done. We've focused on that. And with uh, the strengthening of public policies, we are reverting this process, mainly with the use of uh, non-fossil fuels and non-discriminate non elimination of forests. Thank you, Mr. Minister. Brazil is also working on climate change. Many studies are being conducted and it'd be interesting to know what policies are being implemented because undoubtedly in the Amazonia, in the Amazon region, there's the area there and we'd like to know what is your opinion, to what extent climate change is being controlled or is affecting or not affecting Brazil. Firstly, I would like to emphasize that in Brazil, close to 60% of the territory is, like the, is as the Portuguese discovered it 500 years ago, mainly because of the, mainly the Amazon reefs, but we also have vast experience in the use of biofuels in our country. Today, just about all vehicles, the cars are biofuel. We can use ethanol or gasoline or any mix of both. And just as Argentina, we in Brazil have not, not had problems of competition between the supply of food and the production of biofuel. On the contrary, for several years, we were able to achieve records for grain production and sugarcane. Today, sugarcane production is stable but we've had great success in past years. And this year also, the Brazilian Congress passed new legislation on the use of land in rural areas trying to attain a balance between agricultural use and environment, environmental preservation in accordance with our legislation. All farmers must leave part of their land unused for agriculture <coughs> in the case of more traditional areas, such as in the south, here on the border with Argentina and Uruguay, at least 20% of the property may not be used for agriculture. In the case of the Amazon, 80% cannot be used. 
if you want to purchase land in the Amazon region, you should know that 80% of that land may not be used for commercial pro purposes. And in the central area of Brazil, 35% of the land must remain untouched for environmental use. Additionally, the areas along rivers and lakes as well as uh, slopes cannot be used for agricultural purposes. And this is a very stringent piece of legislation and farmers are not happy with this because they receive no payment for the land they cannot use. There's no benefit for the farmers, but yes, for society. With regard to climate change, in Brazil, we have specific legislation in this regard, and this is Law 12187 of 2009 establishing the national policy on climate change. This involves a sectorial program to consolidate a low carbon economy with agriculture. The purpose of the government is to substantially reduce greenhouse gas emissions until 2020. And for this, some specific programs were put in place. For example, low carbon emission agriculture designed to recover cover pasture areas, degraded pasture areas, stimulate the integration of agriculture with forestry, stimulate the adoption of the no-till system or direct feeding, stimulate biological fixation of nitrogen, promote reforestation actions by stimulation of implanted forests and also financing of uh, animal waste. The ABC program includes financing to stimulate the adoption of the farmers adopting this technology. This year, the government of Brazil is allocating 2 billion reales to finance the adoption of these technologies by the farmers and also through Embrapa, we created the program for climate intelligence in agriculture, which includes several actions with the goal of stimulating research, technology transfer in this area. These projects involved directly over 500 researchers and financing resources totaling about 60 
million reales. So, in Brazil, we have a specific law and programs in place promoting the adoption of technologies that help to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Thank you. Thank you, Gustavo. Which has been the main effect of climate change in Chile? In the central area of uh, Chile, where we produce uh, agriculture for export, food and wine mainly, we've seen uh, lower rainfalls than in normal years. La Nina has affected us strongly in the Pacific area with uh, droughts and some kind of uh, displacement of movement of crops to the south because the temperature is a bit warmer. I would also like to highlight that we have seen some uh, ice melting in the south of Patagonia, with extreme temperatures, as I said, in the north. Very cloudy days, many cloudy days. And that uh, is a difficulty for plants to uh, focus their sugars. Uh, the concentrated sugars. So we are facing all this through a national plan for mitigation vis-a-vis -vis climate change, given more information to farmers, um, IT programs to uh, predict and uh, forecast this. We are working with some Chinese uh, methods uh, bombarding clouds with some successful uh, results. Um, bombarding uh, clouds whenever possible. Uh, we are building new dams. Uh, we are using forestry. In Chile, we have 2.5 million um, hectares uh, for forestry, which is practically the same that we have in implanted uh, forests at present. We are working on uh, an agriculture uh, insurance, we, we've got this insurance to protect them, and there is a national mitigation plan involving uh, several events to limit and mitigate and uh, work with farmers so that they uh, do not lose their working capital whenever they face uh, these climate problems. Thank you, Gustavo. And so, uh, are you also facing uh, climate change problems? Or not very strongly? Well, uh, we, <laughs> we have some evidence of that today. Um, I think that climate change is an irreversible fact, and uh, what we can see is uh, some climate effects that are much stronger. As a country, Uruguay is making its best efforts to try and identify the, the sense of this climate change, of course, uh, taking up the responsibility of uh, reducing uh, the share that uh, uh, we have. Although we are persuaded that um, even though we make our best efforts, climate change is a reality. And uh, in this part of the world, we have used uh, fuel fossil fuels excessively, so we can't deny reality. What is very clear is that we have to do research and innovate to be adapted to climate change and define how our productive uh, production system will be in the future. Most certainly it will change. And uh, we will have to work on genetic improvement, adapting to new climate conditions. We will have to use some other resources uh, we've already got some defined policies to use uh, water better in irrigation, the question of irrigation. 95% of our rainfall is lies away, so how, how can we keep it? How can we store it to be able to use it when we are in need of it? And there are some political definitions there or decisions we 
We know yeah. that um, there are large uh, companies with uh, many hectares, and that involves a cultural change of managing those uh, water resources at farmers' levels. Obviously, we have to define uh, and, and work on carbon chains, water chains, and their effects, because we are aware that there is a real tide here, but uh, we are food producers. Therefore, when they tell us that our cows have an important part of the guilt and, and of climate change, we want to be sure about that, because it's not possible to be able to eliminate the problem of hunger in the world if we can't produce. So I think that agriculture or our cows are necessary. And so we have to sit down at the table and analyze and discuss that. Uh, very briefly, I think I'm uh, summing up this thing. We do have problems. We do have some political definitions. We do have uh, uh, research lines focused specifically on climate change adaptation. I would like to highlight here that in this conference, we've got a specialized panel on climate change. And there are several initiatives uh, by several countries in the region working together to do some research on climate change. I would like to give the floor now to the representative of Bolivia. Those of us closer to the coast, uh, we seem to have si similar problems. What about you uh, up high? Have you seen important climate changes? Thank you. Bolivia is not only the Andean area out of the 103 ecosystems recognized in the world. We've got 84 of those ecosystems. Uh, this is a mega diverse country. And we've got an important uh, forestry wealth. Uh, planet lungs are also in Bolivia, in a large part of our national territory. Studies have been made in Bolivia about the impact that climate change is having in our country. And we could see the reduction <coughs> in rainfalls in the Titicaca Lake, which is shared with Peru. We've also seen the effect on the uh, Potosi in the Uyuni uh, salt, uh, uh, salt mine. And uh, we have uh, looked into the areas in Bolivia that have been affected by climate change. So there was one first report uh, issued by this study. However, our president has made the world know that Bolivia will contribute a, a grain of sand and will face climate change at world level, definitely. That uh, doesn't uh, involve just one country uh, um, taking up uh, policies in the country domestically, but it means that all countries involved in this uh, issue must take up a position vis-a-vis -vis these problems at world level. But uh, to contribute with this little uh, grain of sand, Bolivia is uh, uh, having some uh, changes. One of them has to do with uh, a political reform as a fruit of a uh, national assembly. And that new political constitution is uh, setting forth some guidelines to face these problems. We've been working on new uh, regulatory frameworks and this is the case of the Motherland Act. Bolivia is facing this issue because in the past few days we uh, passed a uh, um, NAC uh, called Motherland Act, which is sort of umbrella or a filter for all rules and regulations in our country so that all those rules and regulations go through this control. Now, this Framework Act of our motherland gives us uh, a way of how to, a guideline as to how to live with the mother nature, but also not as an object, but as subject of uh, public interest. It permeates all levels, and it establishes some criminal uh, penalties for irreversible environmental damages. 
So it's important to uh, take into account these type of policies and implement them. As I said, Bolivia has an important diversity, and we are trying to recover Andean and Amazonian technologies that we have in our country so that impacts are minimum. So this type of policies are allowing us to be able to diversify food production in our country. This is just an example that, uh, you know, this, this um, Mother Nature Act is one example, apart from the production uh, uh, reform, the agrarian reform that uh, our president has carried out. But as regards to the Framework Act of uh, Mother Nature, there is a, an, an article set forth that uh, refers to climate change and how we Bolivians have to face this world problem. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to thank you on the name of the Global Forum of Agricultural Research and also on behalf of the organizing committee on the uh, global uh, conference on GCART and the CGIAR participation of the ministers and representatives. I would like to inform you that uh, I would like to, we would like to ask you to stay on in this room. We are going to award uh, Luis Malasi's prize and then we will have a um, gala dinner offered by the government of Uruguay. Thank you.